Chapter 6, Our Family Isn't Like That. The Robbery and Homicide Division of the Los Angeles Police Department is responsible on a citywide basis for investigating homicides involving serial killers, arson as a manner of death, intense media coverage or high profile, and multiple victims, generally three or more in one incident. Located in the Parker Center or Police Administration Building in downtown Los Angeles, the RHD, which was established in 1969, had taken part in numerous high profile investigations since its inception. These included the Manson family murders of 1969, the shootout with the radical Simeonese Liberation Army in 1974, the Bob's Big Boy Massacre of 1980, as well as several serial killer cases of the late 1970s and early 1980s, the Skid Row Stabber, Hillside Strangler, Sunset Strip Killer, and Freeway Killer. By the end of the summer of 1984, two new serial killers occupied much of RHD's time. With two kills in the first half of 1984, an assailant described as having long curly hair, bulging eyes, and wide space rotting teeth would be dubbed by the media the walk-in killer or the valley intruder. Eventually, linked to at least 14 killings in the Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area, the perpetrator, Richard Ramirez, would come to be known as the Night Stalker. Also active in the summer of 1984 was a killer of prostitutes in South Central LA. Eventually, 10 were killed, all but two African American. The suspect was described as black with a dark complexion, 30 to 35 years old, and 5 feet 10 inches to 6 feet tall. He is said to have had black hair, brown eyes, smooth skin, a medium build, and muscular arms. As the body toll mounted and the case went unsolved, neighborhood fear and frustration grew. This was part of a larger pattern during the early 80s in which several different serial killers preyed upon young black women in South Central. Collectively, the murders were considered the doings of the South Side Slayer. In addition to serial killings, drug and gang killings were also on the rise, particularly in South Central. Thus, my family's case was the latest in a spate of tragic violence to hit the region. But its extreme nature shocked even the callous inhabitants of South Central. It quickly grabbed the attention of the press, the police, and the mayor's office. As my family's case was considered high profile and involved multiple victims, robbery homicide immediately took over the investigation from the division detectives. Inside my family's home, officers from the LAPD's Newton and 77th Street divisions had already responded to the scene. These units were the West Coast equivalents of Fort Apache, the Bronx, outpost of law and order surrounded by an urban war zone. If the Bronx was made infamous by arson fires and a post-apocalyptic landscape, South Central was plagued by the memory of Watts and the twin scourges of street gangs and crack cocaine. Located in the heart of South Central and patrolling some of LA's toughest neighborhoods, officers of these divisions affected a certain bravado. They saw in their units that thin blue line protecting society from the forces of disorder and chaos. The 77th Division's motto captures the mentality, violent men for a violent society. Newton's nickname, Shoot Newton. But like the battle-scarred residents of South Central, these hardened street fighters found themselves taken aback by what they saw inside. When they left the house, there were tears in their eyes. Upon their arrival at the scene, members of my family were quickly whisked away, taken to nearby Newton Station for questioning. When a family member is murdered, the killer is often one of their own. In the squad room at the station, my sisters Joan and Crystal were placed in chairs facing different directions and told not to speak to each other. Neither knew any details nor the extent of what had occurred. Another sister, Daphne, sat separately at the station. Earlier in the morning, she had received a call from her son Ivan, who said something real bad had happened in the house. After Ivan's call, Daphne had spent the morning walking around in circles and babbling. Once she composed herself enough to make a call, she phoned her older sister Mary at work in San Diego. Start praying, Daphne told Mary. Something awful happened. Daphne then begged the Lord. Just let them be alive. Let them be on life support. Just let me see them once more before they die. But when I arrived at the station and my sister saw my expression through a glass partition, they knew it was all over. The oldest son and the rock of the family had no answers. I just stood there numb with a look of empty shock, my arms hanging helplessly at my sides. Seeing my face, Joan, an officer in the military, Judge Advocate General's corpse, lost control and fell to the floor and the questioning by the police continued, and my family countered with questions of our own. Why are we being treated like this? Our family isn't like that, Joan implored. We don't do things like that. 
Crystal, an intensive care nurse who treated terminally ill cancer patients, could not stand the tension. For Crystal, the suffering that took place within the hospital walls was at least understandable. But this was surreal. An hour before, she walked the halls at work. Now she was interrogated, surrounded by photos of LAPD's most wanted, stared at by killers. She screamed at the officers, what's going on in my mother's house? When the police finally explained, Joan hyperventilated and pounded the walls. Why would anybody want to do that? When the police first responded to 126 West 59th Street, they noticed nothing amiss. There was no sign of forced entry. The front door was open, the screen door unlocked. The living room looked neat and undisturbed. As they made their way through the house, the next room, the dining room, was likewise without any signs of disruption or disorder. Only when they turned left from the hallway did the spell break. In the kitchen, the body of an older woman wearing a bathrobe and slippers lay dead on the floor. An upside down frying pan covered her chest. She suffered three cranial gunshot wounds. A large pool of blood radiated from her head. All wounds were through and through. Evidence of the close range shots stain the kitchen's east wall and curtains. A wad of scalp rested atop the bananas on the kitchen table. During the medical examiner's on-scene inspection, a copper jacketed expended bullet fell from the bathrobe's folds. A half-finished cup of coffee sat on the kitchen counter. Beans simmered on the stove. Bullet holes dotted the east wall. As the officers made their way through the house, three more bodies were found in the northwest bedroom. A woman in her 20s lay slumped in her bed, also shot three times. One bullet went through her chin, another penetrated her right cheek, the third to the right side of her chest near the armpit. Two bullets exited the body, one lodged in the rib cage. Bullet holes pierced the bedroom's west wall. Blood spatter stained it. A young teenage boy was found lying on the floor, covered in his bedclothes. He suffered one gunshot wound to the right side of his forehead. The bullet exited through the back of his skull and lodged into the floor beneath his head. A little boy lay in bed under the covers. Shot once in the back of the head, the bullet exited his left temple before coming to rest in the mattress. The initial examination of the bodies concluded. The emergency response team prepared the gurneys to take them to the morgue, where they would be identified and formal autopsies performed. Following the removal of the deceased, a Latin fingerprint examiner attempted to lift prints from within the house. In the northwest bedroom where Dietra, Damani, and Damon had slept, the technician took powder, dusted a fingerprint brush, and where prints were developed, placed tape over the print and then transferred it to a card. A total of 17 prints were taken from the room, including a nearly full palm print recovered from a red storage trunk. The fingerprint examiner also dusted the southwest bedroom where Neil and Ivan had slept and from which he had recovered three prints. One was taken from my mother's bedroom, which stood between the other two on the west side of the house. Neonhydrin, a chemical that reacts and turns purple when it detects the chemicals found in fingerprints, was sprayed on the rough wood of the back door. No prints were revealed. In addition to the prints, crime scene technicians recovered several expended bullets and bullet fragments from inside and outside the house. Besides the rounds found under the sleeping children's heads, bullet fragments were also recovered from the driveway and house to the west at 132 West 59th Street. These went through the wall of the Northwest bedroom behind the bed where Dietra had slept. Other expended rounds came from the area outside the kitchen embedded in 122 West 59th Street, the blue house to the east. These projectiles had ripped through the kitchen walls and window. A total of seven expended shell casings were recovered from the kitchen and Northwest bedroom. Some of the shell casings bore the head stamp RP30 carbine while others were stamped WCC-83. The manufacturers of the casings were Winchester and Remington Peters. The expended casings were ejected from a semi-automatic rifle, indicating a minimum of seven shots fired from such a weapon. The jacket was photographed and taken into evidence.